in Fate and Destiny, Rav Soloveitchik, and we're on page 57. What, uh, just to remind us, what we were talking about before was that uh, the Rav was making a distinction between the, uh, the destiny of fate, uh, I'm sorry, the covenant of fate and the covenant of destiny. The covenant of fate was uh, a, we're on the passive person in that, and Hashem just takes us, uh, for instance, takes us, takes us out of Egypt. We didn't do anything for that. We weren't part of that. He forced us in. He took us out from uh, Pharaoh, and he became our king. So we changed one thing, king for the other. When it comes to the covenant of destiny, that's what we have to be active in that. We have to actually do things in order to become part of that. So that's what the Rav is really pushing toward, namely that we have an, uh, a, a covenant that we're right now, since Sinai, have that covenant of destiny where we entered, we willingly entered into a contract, unlike the other one where it was just a matter of, okay, so you, you, the one owner, for instance, if I'm working in, in a store and the owner decides to sell to a different person, I'm still in the same store. I'm just working for a different owner. It's no big deal. I'm passive and I'm very passive. All I care about is that the person signed the check actually has the ability to make it worthwhile for me. But otherwise, it's nothing to me. As compared to me going out and trying to get another job where, I, where I'm making my own destiny. Fine. That's what we've been talking to until now. Here we talk about two different things. Uh, another definite, another dimension. Namely, it's called the camp and congregation. He's going to make a distinction between these two words, machane and eda. So he says, in order to explain the difference between the people of fate and the nation of destiny, it is worth taking note of another antithesis. Namely, the antithesis between camp, machane, and congregation, eda. The, ter the Torah has used both terms together in speaking of the Israelites. It says, make uh, the two trumpets of silver of beaten work shall you make them and they shall be unto you for calling of the congregation and for causing the camp to set forward. Now, if I'm just reading that, I'm just, uh, and it's in Hebrew, what I'll just decide is that God is using those two terms interchangeably and no big deal don't get you know don't get lost in the details as well well the rav who never saw anything and nor should we as a matter of fact see anything as extra in the torah god as we know many times from many courses was very specific with the words he was using and each word carries a lot of meaning so the rav identifies what's going on he says camp and congregation constitute two distinct sociological phenomena, two separate groups lacking any common features, devoid of any symbiotic relationship. The camp is created as a result of a desire for self-defense and is nurtured by this by a sense of fear. Okay, that's the camp. The, uh, the congregation is cre uh, created as a result of a longing for the realization of an exalted ethical idea and is nurtured by the sentiment of love. Understand the two differences? Okay. So he's saying the camp is out of fear. The congregation is basically an, uh, an ethical idea. So he says, fate reigns in unbounded fashion in the camp. Destiny reigns in the congregation. The camp constitutes a particular stage in the historical development of the people, while the existence of a nation is identical with that of the congregation. The camp by its nature does not constitute a distinctly human phenomenon. In the animal kingdom as well, we can readily discern the glimmers of this phenomenon. There too, the camp serves as protection against harm. Let flocks of sheep and cattle suddenly suddenly sense that danger is lurking somewhere and overcome by panic, they will confusedly stream down from every green mountain and high pasture and hastily herd together, interlock their horns, press their heads one against the other. 
Fear finds its instinctive mechanical expression in the quest for survival through sheer physical contig con uh, contiguity. The primitive uh, urge for individual mute creatures to come together in face of opposition and danger and form one camp is a basic feature of, you, of animal instinct. Now, Charles, I said to you a great topic. The reason is because when I saw this, I said, you know what, if I don't go off on a rant at this point, I'm going to be missing something. There is a common feeling that in the from world, in the religious world, that we are batting down the hatches, as it were. We are, we are going into ourselves. Why? Because of fear of assimilation. And you know what? It's possibly true. When the Hasidim wear their, their kapata or dress as the old statement of the uh, 16th century or 17th century Polish noblemen, and I thereby become clearly identified in their dress today. So they are indeed hankering, they're, they're hunkering down. They don't want to be part of this simulation. And they will tell you that that's why they dress in that way. They're not ashamed of that. They want to be clearly different from the non-Jew today so that the non-Jew will not want to be part of that group. And they don't want to be part of the non-Jewish group because the Torah says we have to be a distinct uh, group by, unto ourselves. So we shouldn't dress like the non-Jew, we shouldn't speak like the non-Jew. So if that's the case, they would argue that they are totally 100% correct in doing that. Well, that's fine in, in matter of dress. Then what happens is we come to the internet or any other thing we, we come to and they say, we don't want to be part of that because of the influence it could have upon us. Now the question is, and you have to think about this, are they doing it out of fear of what could impact upon them? Or are they doing it for the exalted mission? Are they the people of, by the way, I'm not just picking on Chassidim, I'll pick on the straight Orthodox too. Are we, a pe uh, when we act this way, are we acting as a people of fate? Uh, as the camp where we all lock together in, uh, what's the expression, in lockstep? Uh, we're, we're all in lockstep and we're walking and we're all dressing the same and so on and so forth because we want to keep that, those outside influences away from us? Or are we acting as a congregation? And that's the question we have to ask ourselves. And that we are, namely, that we have this ethical, ethical, exalted ethical idea it's nurtured by the sentiment of love. In other words, why am I doing what I'm doing? Is it out of fear or out of love? And when I say fear, I'm not saying respect. Unlike with here at Shemaim, you say respect of heaven. You, you respect what Hashem wants. You understand that Hashem is only going to do what's the best for us. But when we're afraid of them, of the them, influencing us, and that's why we're reacting this way. Then, according to the Rav's statements, if I can be so bold, then he is saying, we become just the camp. We become the, like the, the, the uh, as he said, like the sheep or the, the, everybody comes down, streams together, locks your horns, don't let us in, don't let anything in. Protect, protect, protect. And I think that's how many people view what's happening. Whether or not we're actually doing that, I don't know. And when I read this though, I thought of those, the, the, all those statements. So, I ask you, do you think that we're acting out of fear when we do this or out of love for, for our vision of what Hashem wants from us? What would you say? Fear is easier to see. You see it as fear. So you think we're just at the camp at this point, not the congregation. That's the easier one to, to argue. Mm -hmm. How could you argue a congregation? Since that's the easiest one, let's go the hard way. How could you argue that what we're doing is else congregation? And it's very important to argue this out because the Rav wasn't just writing this when he wrote this, just to say, oh, what beautiful words. They're so nice. I agree. What are you agreeing on? We have to understand what he was dealing with here. When do I lose my fear and when do I start working on my exalted, again, using his language, exalted ethical idea 
where I'm doing this out of love for Hashem. That's why I'm dressing this way. That's why I'm talking this way. That's why I'm learning my Torah. Not because I'm protecting myself from the outside world and its influences. That's why I want my filters on my internet or whatever else is going to be. Whatever else we're picking on. That's why I want to dress in my dark clothes. I personally think the way we dress in dark clothes is because it makes you look skinnier. But okay. <laughs> I noticed that when I wear the white, I, look, I don't look as good. Okay. When I wear dread, black, it's much better. Blend in that way. Blends in. Everything fits. <laughs> ten pounds takes off 10 pounds. But really, why are we doing what we're doing? When we go to glot kosher, when we go to uh, what other people view as extremes, I'm not saying they're extremes, by the way. What I'm saying, when other people view it, are we doing because we want to get this devekas to Hashem, as we learned Tuesday night with Derech Hashem? Are we doing it out of just avas Hashem, love of Hashem, or are we doing it because of yira for the people, or if it's against assimilation? Not yira Hashem. Yira Hashem is out of the picture here. It's either ava, it could be yira with Hashem, it could be yira Hashem, it could be ava Hashem, fear and love, it could, it could be anything like that, no problem. But if it's fear of the people and fear of the outside influences, then all we are is a camp. And we're not a congregation at that point. A con- and if you think about congregations, what happens, with, and using, well, again, what he's doing, when we make a shul, when we make a congregation, we have a vision in mind, and it's not only to break off from the previous place. We say we're breaking off or we're starting something because this is how we view it should be. We have a vision. And that's what pulls us together. We're not pulling together because, oh my God, the other side world is getting us. That's not, that's not congregations. Okay, so that's, again, using all those things, we have to really think about where are we holding right now? What's going on when we do what we do? Are we doing it because we're afraid of the outside influences? And that, if that's the case, then I'm just a camp. I'm just a covenant of fate. There's no destiny involved. Or am I, am I proactive in this? And then it's destiny. That's how the Rabbi is saying it. You with me? Okay. So, uh, so, so, so yeah. So to, to, it's easier to see us functioning out of fear. You know, what, what would it take to see the other uh, I know more you know people should be smiling correct people should be happy people should be if people you know, right light. so and correct there, you know oh, everybody's so miserable if you see people being happy if you that's why is in Psalms it says if do Hashem besimcha serve Hashem with joy David Amalek was trying to get across a very important principle that I have to serve Hashem fine but I can do it in a negative manner where it's a yoke upon my back and I have to do it. Or, and it, that's again, that's fate. I'm a slave to this. Or I can do it besimcha. I recognize, wow, what a beautiful opportunity I have to connect to the omnipresent. And th- that and everything that goes with that, that's such a joy to me. Like I said, I, when my kids were growing, when my boy was growing up, Shlomo, and so when he becomes three years old or a little younger than that, so you put, three years old actually, you put a key paw on, on the boy's head. Okay, it's, they get, some people get, they give a haircut, but as soon as you can, you put the key paw on. And, and before three, they go like this. <laughs> they throw it away. Even at three, by the way, they're looking, at, no, I don't like this. <laughs> they throw it away. And I always would say to my son, this is, before I put it on, I said, this is your crown. You know what a king does with a crown? Always wears it proudly on his head. I gave it that way. As a matter of fact, there was somebody playing basketball in the yeshiva, and I saw the kippah on the ground. This is a high school kid. And I said to him, Sadik, your crown is on the floor. How can you do that to your crown? Would a king let, his, let it be on the ground? He said, I didn't realize it was there. He knew it was there, but he picked it up. I said, remember, it's something proud to wear. It's your crown. It's your glory. Don't let it go on the ground anymore. I said nicely. So I think the kid responded. Who knows what he did five seconds later. (laughs) But for that five seconds, I got him thinking in a positive way. It's not a negative. It's not a burden. 
It's not fate. It's your destiny. I can be a king or I can be a pauper. But it's my destiny. I have to choose. So I think that's what he's going with. So you're right. If people would smile and be generally ha genuinely happy and not just the smiling people who want to get you and hook you and then grab you. But if I'm genuinely happy with what I'm doing, then that's Ibdul Shem Basimcha. Then it's a covenant of uh, destiny. If not, it's fate. That's a good example of the Vikas. Right. That you're under the, the universe. You're, you're under God. That's right. You're connected to God. That's what I'm saying. You, all, you, all depends on how you view it. If I see my attachment as a positive, then it's destiny. If I see it as a negative, then it's fate. I could give you an example that you've used many times that for some people Shabbat is a restriction. Mm -hmm. For others, it's liberating. Correct. It all has to do with your attitude or what's happening. I once I knew a young lady who I was walking with and we were just uh, when I was uh, when we were all single. <laughs> so I was walking with her and she said she confided in me. Now the whole world will know. But she confided with me that before she was religious, she, everywhere she, and the women do this, everywhere they walk, they have that, what, the, we, what they call a uh, pocketbook, what I call a carrying the world. Because they have every single possible thing in that, that pocketbook. I've never seen such a thing. We have wallets, we put us, it, it kills our pockets, but in, we don't have file, nail files, we don't have every possible coinage in there we, we have what we have and but she said when i start to keep shabbos i ha i found myself walking like this because it was and because i was so used to the, and i finally realized wow i don't have that weight Great. it was a freeing situation she says uh she said and it but that's it if i can look at it as a negative oh how can i go and i knew one guy who said this he said to me he was a rabbinical student I think it was a rabbinical student in JTS and the conservative. And he said, I can't go without my wallet and money on me. I it's, it's, it's ridiculous. I have to have 50 on hundred dollars on me. <laughs> okay. Whether or not he still does it, I don't know. I don't know where the guy is anymore, but he was arguing that he has to carry money. Even on Shabbos, it's, it's Pekuch Nefesh, it's saving a life. What happened if something happened to him? I said, are you crazy? What's going to happen to you is somebody's going to find you. They're going to uh, take your money and kill you. That's, <laughs> you haven't done anything. But that's what he felt. It's the exact opposite. Day without my cell phone. Right. The exact opposite of what this, this young lady was saying to me. She was overjoyed that she could release herself of that. And he was saying, no, I need that materialism. Shabbos is such a torture to me. Okay, so you're right. It all depends on my perspective again. And that's what the Rav is arguing. If it's a negative, it's a covenant of fate. If it's positive, it's a covenant of destiny. And he's using his words, camp, to say, I just grab everybody and we, we lock horns and we don't want to let anything come in. We're going to stop all the outside influences. We're going to protect ourselves. Protect, protect, protect. Again, that's not destiny. That's just fate. I have to protect myself versus the other way where I, which he's going to develop where I'm in the, uh, the going for an, eth an exalted ethical idea. Maybe it's like the, the balance between the Yitzhah and the Yitzhah Tov. Okay. Where one is not bad and one good. That you need both of these and they interact Correct. for that getting closer to God. Correct. Good. Good, same sort of thing, correct. In this, if you, if you compared this camp to congregation to fate and destiny, that you need both of those. You need the, the passive, the study, the contemplation, the learning, but you also need the activity to put that into practice. The Rav is, count, is counting the learning as activity. Okay, that's an active thing. That's an active thing. Okay, for him, that's on that, destiny. That's, that's destiny. Okay. He's saying, well, he, that's what I'm saying. When I look it at... It would be the lack of learning. Lack of learning where I'm just, I'm trapped. I have to do it. Where it's a negative. Right, negative. Okay. It's negative. 
but 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 it could be. And by the way, if I learn even else, I oh god, I have to learn because it's my obligation. Again, that's uh, that's my fate. I have to do it. So I, so it could be learning too, but or it could be putting my tefillin. I could be going to shul. Could be anything. If I'm looking at it in a negative manner, it's the simcha. The, the, the opposite the simcha. It's the joy yeah. that makes it destiny. It's it's the it's the atzevu the or the atzeilu too. It's the laziness and the uh, sadness or the anger, the cause of the whole thing that makes it the other way. So it's, again, I'm doing the same action, but it's it depends on how I view it. I wear the kippah because I see it's a crown. Oh, now it's destiny. I, see, I wear the kippah because my father's going to kill me if I don't. That's fate. That's <laughs> nothing else. So we'll continue now. It says, in the, everybody's good? Okay. So in the human realm as well, the camp is created only as a result of fear. When a person is terror-stricken by his involuntary fate-laden existence, he grabs his own helplessness and joins with his fellow, both for protection from and victory over the enemy. By the way, you see this with addictions. A person has to, uh, I'll, I'll use AA for this. The, uh, the person who is an alcoholic, he, he finds himself in this quote-unquote fate. It's, it was fate, okay? I need to protect myself, so I'm going to find the group that knows me or knows the system, and we all will protect ourselves from the enemy, namely alcohol. And that's, but really that's what it is. There's no, I, I have to work at it. It's not destiny anymore. At least the way I understand how that works. <coughs> and how this is working. That would be the situation where, <coughs> excuse me, where I make a camp. The organization of a camp serves as a, a military tactic. Consider the phraseology used by the Torah. When you go forth in camp against your enemies... The camp is born out of dread of extinction and annihilation, out of fear imposed upon by fate. From the camp, there, uh, from a camp, there emerges the people. The Israelites in Egypt were a camp to begin with. When God freed them, they attained the rank of a people. However, the congregation con constitutes a distinctive human phenomenon. It is an expression of man's powerful spirit. The congregation is a typically human creation, a creation imbued with the splendor of, a, of the human personality. Again, use a, a shul as this, or a community. Use it when we're trying to create something that we're giving it a personality. The congregation is created not as a result of negative factors, as a result of fear of fate, that pursues the man who senses his misery and weakness, but as a result of positive drives. Now, if you think of a successful Jewish community, it'll be the one that is the forward-looking one. Now, looking back and saying, I remember the good old days, what we used to have, blah, 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 blah. No, that, you, you just consign yourself to fate. You, you need to go destiny. You have to have a positive look to, forward to, and start creating, figure out how to get new people in, how to get new people, you know, the, or the old people to become reinvigorated, anything like that. That's why when you get a new rabbi in, many times, the congregation feels, oh, finally, a breath of fresh air. It, okay, then the next day they wake up. But, <laughs> but one day they feel happy. But it's but it's something there. That they say the new guy will has he's the new broom sweeps in the corners that nobody else sees. But that's the positive drives, and that's the congregation. So the foundation of the congregation is destiny. The congregation is a group of individuals possessing a common past, a common future, common goals and desires, a common aspiration for a world which is holy, good, and beautiful and a common, unique, and unified destiny. By the way, what does, that, what does that also have in mind? Marriage. When you get married, if you've done your homework properly, then your spouse is going to share all these things with you. There's, there has to be a commonality in the past, otherwise you're not going to understand each other, which is why when a 20-year-old 
uh, when a, you have a, a difference of 20 years in a marriage, that causes tremendous stress in the marriage. Because you say something and your spouse doesn't know what you're talking about. It's like when I make, even this, when I'm speaking, giving classes, and I will mention the song, well, I mentioned the song yesterday. I know your sons didn't get it. It's too young. So can you imagine if you're in a marriage with that, where I say something and my, and my spouse wouldn't get it because she's too young? That causes a real problem. You miss my jokes. You miss everything. What are we doing here? What? Good, good, die young. I know that. I know the saying. I, just, I, did, I didn't know the song. Oh, good. So there you go. I know, I know the saying. You're, okay. We're exceptional. You, you listen to our old music. And <laughs> No, you're not exceptional. As a matter of fact, uh, I, you are exceptional in different things, yeah. but not that because my sister-in-law, when she, uh, when her daughter, was, well, my niece was growing up, my sister-in-law loves the monkeys, you know, the musicals, music, whatever, <laughs> that, that thing. So my daughter, my niece knows those songs. And I'm thinking, out of all the things in the world you had to brainwash her with, it had to be the monkeys. Okay. <laughs> so, if she, so if she talks about Davy Jones, some people know, you know, hopefully. The, but imagine, uh, here she finds somebody with that same thing. It's a commonality. Not that I want to care about the monkeys, but you understand what I'm saying? If I have that background, so now if I, and by the way, this is one, when you start talking about just Jews, if I have a non-religious Jew with a religious Jew, this, the commonality you have is you're Jewish. Very nice. But you don't have a common past. You were always religious. You were never religious. You're still not religious. What's your, why are you doing this to yourselves? It's, it's pretty much a guarantee you're going to gonna flip out sooner or later. So unless you go, unless you're both on the track up or whatever the case is going to be, or never uh, the other way, God forbid, the, the track down. So okay, so then you can pull it off. But even there, by the way, the non the religious guy who becomes non-religious, in other words, they have their the yeshiva background and so on and so forth. They they have their sayings that is brainwashed into them. That again, the non-religious don't know. So, so again, it causes all that problem. So that's what you're saying. A congregation is you have a common past, future, common goals, desires. Like I said, a really good way to have a marriage. That truly is the best way to have a marriage. And then you have a common aspiration for what you want to build. That's beautiful. The beginning of the congregation is grounded in the tradition of the patriarchs, in the people's heritage, reaching back to its obscure dawn. While its end is rooted in the shared eschatological vision, we have to know do we have the same vision of what's going to happen when we die, or in the future, uh, the, the revival of the dead, if you will, when Mashiach comes, the end, the end game. Do we have the same vision or not? If we don't have the same vision, we're not going to build towards that, right? I have a vision to be a, a billionaire. My wife has a vision to be a regular person. It's not going to. It's not going to work. Not that she does. Not that I do either. But I'm just saying, if we would have such a vision, it just wouldn't work in the end. We're working at different, working for different ends. We don't have the same goal, goals anymore. So therefore, we. Her goal may be a noble goal. My goal may be a noble goal. But we're not going to match up. And that's what again a community. When we're building a community, you want to. Uh, congregation, I'm sorry. When you build a congregation using this model, you really want to have all those things in common. Check it out before you get involved, as it were. That it doesn't work. It, 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 it not working doesn't necessarily mean divorce. Doesn't mean you know it. it you know you can you, you just won't be as effective toward a common goal. You, you know you won't. You know, you know, you know, you struggle through and. And, and, and make your mediocre neither one of you ah but is that is that fate or destiny again not destiny. what it's not destiny yeah. so it's fate because yeah. you've consigned yourself to I'm going to be a passive in this I can't win well again he's he's calling for action from the Jew or you can try to win and you're both trying to win your things but because you're not you're not working together correct you know it's going to be ineffective yeah Okay, good. You could have two Jews in one kosher and one non-kosher. <laughs> you would have real problems. 
You do. I mean, there are people that have those sort of situations, and one is forced to give in to the other. Either way, whoever's the strongest one wins. But it's, uh, and I don't know if there's any statistics who would be the stronger one in, in those cases. But it's obviously easier to be non kosher, but I'm not sure if that non kosher person always wins. Again, it's whoever has the stronger personality in that situation will be the winner of that if if it's such a thing but what i'm what he, again what he's looking for is the only reason that the congregation is getting together is we have these commonalities and we want to shoot for the for the uh, the same thing we have the same goal in mind if i don't why am i getting involved in the end and again we have to have that certainly with marriage we have to have that at least we should try it's really hard because we all base it upon quote unquote love which is really lust so when you're looking at lust everything else falls away and that's part of the problem that's why in the from system you go on a shidduch how do you get to the shidduch how do you get to the date in the first place because you have people have talked about the, this possibility and they looked on the piece of paper as it were they did the the balance sheet he has this is this so on and so forth it seems to be a good and the two people who are doing these actually care about the people they have a vested interest in making sure these people are happy so if that's the case they've gone through a lot of the work that i don't have to and then what's happening you're going you're talking all this time you know kissing you're not doing anything else so it's a whole different set, uh, set of rules and even there, there's divorce, but the divorce rate amongst orthodoxy is, I think, two, three or five percent. It's quite small compared to the rest. Or, and maybe it went up to 10, if God forbid, but I'm not sure. It's certainly not as high as the regular world out there. Okay, uh, so. So, it's, okay, I said that. so the Hebrew word for congregation, Ada, now this you all like, is related to the Hebrew word for witness, aid. The members of the congregation are witnesses. And to what do they bear witness if not to events that are long since past and to a wondrous future that has not yet arrived? The congregation encompasses not only the individuals living in the here and now, but all those who have lived and who will, and who will live from time immemorial until the eschaton, the end of times. The dead who have long passed, long since passed away, continue to abide in the realm of the congregation. And those who are yet to be born are already living in his domain. This also gives you an insight to what the Midrash that says that everybody was at Sinai. Our Neshama was at Sinai. And there's no Jew that wasn't at Sinai. And so that's, again, using, this, using that, I'm sure he's coming up with this vision. That the ones who have passed away, they're still there. The ones who have yet to be born are already there. The congregation is a holy nation that has no fear of fate and is not compelled to live against its will. It believes in its own destiny and it dedicates itself out of its own free will to the realization of that destiny. The covenant in Egypt was made with a people born from a camp. The covenant at Sinai was made with a holy nation. So again, he's looking at both of those things. We had, we certainly came from the camp, but we moved into the congregation. So now we deal with conversion through circumcision and immersion. So as the individual's participation in the fate and the destiny of the chosen people, a nation, and and his experience of belonging to Knesset Israel, the Jewish community, as a complete entity which actualizes through its historical existence. The two ideas of Chesed, loving kindness and Kedusha holiness, together such participation and such experience of belonging are indissolvable and indivisible. The covenant at Sinai it consummated the covenant in Egypt. Destiny attached itself to fate, like you were saying with the Yitzhahara and the Yitzhatov. Okay, so he's coming to where you, where you were. Both become one distinct covenantal unit. It is impossible to formulate a worldview that opposes the unity of the people of loving kindness and the holy nation. That which belongs together cannot be sundered. 
a Jew who participates in his people's suffering and fate, but does not bind himself to his destiny, which expresses itself in the life of Torah and mitzvot, violates a fundamental, fundamental principle of Judaism and impairs his own singularity. So, it's that, so they, that's what I'm saying to you, Bill, that as far as the Rav is concerned, Torah, because Torah study is a mitzvot, that's part and parcel of that. Conversely, a Jew who does not grieve over the afflictions of his people, but seeks to separate himself from the Jewish faith, desecrates the holiness of Israel, even, even if he observes the commandments. Now that's a hard pill to swallow. Here I am, I'm following my commandments, and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, but when it comes to grieving over the, uh, the, uh, over the afflictions of the Jewish people, I don't want to do that. I only want to be happy. I don't need the other stuff, right? So we come, we're going to come to a fast day in a couple of uh, weeks, actually. Uh, Shiva Asbatamus. And there's going to be, well, I, I think most Orthodox Jews fast, but the rest don't. They don't even know about it. They're not sharing in the grieving. And even if they do know about it, they say, why should I fast? <laughs> I had someone who's fasting. They don't understand the beauty of fasting, what, what the whole purpose of fasting is. They, don't, they never looked into it. They never studied it. It's just an affliction on their body. But they don't even realize why we're doing it. And I don't know if the Orthodox sometimes realize why they are fasting. I think that's why they look for every leniency in the book to get out of the fasting. It's so important to share in the afflictions of the people, even if they were 2,000 years ago. It's important to remember what we went through. And, to why, and then to think, why did we have to go through that? Have we made that repair yet? It's another thing. I mean, if, if I'm going through all of these things, the people, uh, the temples were destroyed. Why were the temples destroyed? Second temple? Why was the second temple destroyed? Um, on base hatred. On Baseless hatred. Tremendous. Okay. How many people, have, and it says in the Talmud, by the way, as long, and the temple will not be rebuilt until we repair that sin. So for the past 2,000 years or more, we have been mourning the temple's uh, destruction, crying over it, sitting down on the floor, fasting, reading the dirges, going through all of this. But it obviously means we haven't repaired our sin. <laughs> and the question is, how do you repair the sin? Have we thought about that? I mean, Chafetz Chaim Industries certainly tells us every year what we have to do. But even with all that, and they're all day crying, heartfelt crying. I don't make fun of them. But with all that, have we done it? The answer is no. We haven't repaired it. And then why did, uh, during the Omer, why, do we, why don't we get haircuts? Why don't we shave? Why don't we listen to music? Because we didn't show it. Kavod torture each other. We didn't show. Derech Eretz, they didn't show. So uh, did we learn from that? Do we show Derech Eretz? Do we spe still speak Lash Nahara? I think, the, uh, I think we all know the answer to that without me saying it. And again, so we haven't learned anything. Are we sharing in their afflictions? I don't know. So even if we follow all the commandments the Rav is saying, if we don't share in the afflictions of the people, we've missed a basic principle. So therefore, he says, a Gentile who comes to attach himself to the Jewish community must accept upon himself the yoke of both covenants. It's not enough to go just for the covenant of destiny. I have to go for my covenant of fate. He must enter into the magic circle of Jewish fate and in the spirit of holiness dedicate himself to Jewish destiny. In other words, I have both elements I have to do. Conversion consists in a person joining himself to both the people formed by the covenant in Egypt and the holy nation formed by the covenant at Sinai. Take heed of the fundamental principle, of a fundamental principle, excuse me. There can be no partial conversion, and one cannot relinquish even the slightest iota of either of the two covenants, the devotion 
to Knesset Israel again, the Jewish community, both as a people whom God, with a strong hand, took out, took, took unto Himself uh, in Egypt, a people with His own history, suffering, a sense of mutual responsibility, and commitment to deeds of mutual aid, and as a holy nation committed heart and soul to the God of Israel and to His ethical halachic demands. This dual yet unified devotion is the most basic foundation of Judaism and the most fundamental feature of undergoing conversion. Right? So that's what we're demanding of our converts. It's not just I'm going to do the mitzvot, it's that I also accept the fate, that things happen and that I have to deal with all these things that we're talking about. Therefore, the halacha has ruled that a convert who is circumcised but does not immerse himself in the mikvah. And there's these two steps. These are the three steps. But he's looking at two steps specifically. Uh, the third step would be to accept upon himself all the Torah. But it's, you know, if it's a man, he has to undergo circumcision. He has to then go to the mikvah. And while in the mikvah, accept upon himself all the commandments. So what happens? A person becomes, he circumcised himself, but he did not yet immerse himself. Or... He immersed himself, but he's not yet circumcised. Is not a proper convert until he's both circumcised and immerses himself. So I can't do one without the other if I want the conversion to be complete. The act of, of circumcision, Mila, was a charge given to Avram the Hebrew, Avram Ivri, the father of Jewish fate. It was performed by the Israelites in Egypt prior to the sacrificing and eating the Paschal Lamb, the symbol of redemption from Egypt. For this reason, it signifies the people's special fate, its isolation, and its involuntary, its involuntary singularity. Why was it involuntary? The, well, he's saying that the circumcision and everything. Why was it involuntary? He's putting everything together there. Oh, um, in Egypt? Yep. They don't want to get out of Egypt. But what else? What happens when you circumcise yourself in Egypt, certainly? Oh, let me know you're a Jew and make, make you a slave. Right. So you were, it was invol. I didn't want to be singled out. It's involuntary. Again. I didn't want it. I want to be part of the group. Leave me alone. No, you have to do it. Avram Avinu said you have to do it. That's the end of it. Okay, so that's the involuntary singularity. Circumcision, circumcision is the oat, the sign incised in the very physical being of the Jew. It is a permanent sign between the God of the Hebrews and his people. A sign that cannot be effaced, can't be wiped out. If the flesh does not have the covenant of the fate impressed upon it, then the singularity of the people is missing, and the gentle remains out, the gentile remains outside the bounds of the covenant in Egypt. Now, mind you, here's, I want you to think about this. A non-Jew wants to convert, so what does he do? He goes to the mikvah. He says, "Okay, I know what to do. I'll jump on the mikvah." Boom! He jumps on the mikvah. Guess what? In some reality, he, uh, assuming this witness is there, and he accepts upon himself the, the mitzvot, he's Jewish. But the problem is, he didn't have, he wasn't circumcised. So now, for every second that he's not circumcised, he's breaking halacha, and he refuses to become part of the Jewish people. And you know who does this? Some movements do this. They will, they will allow a person to go, a man, a male to go to the mikvah, and they will not circumcise the, ch the person because it's cruel. And I was thinking, you're a bunch of idiots. It's, it's the same halacha that makes him go to the mikvah, that makes him have a circumcision, or a tougher the dumb, or whatever else it's going to be. Don't be an idiot about these things. But of course, this person was. So I, I can't help that. But I luckily, it wasn't an Orthodox conversion, so really the conversion was worthless. But... <laughs> And I think most of his colleagues who hold this worthless too. <laughs> the guy just had his own, own mishagasa. But it's, uh, that's what it is. It's very important. The circumcision, the, 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 and the other way. By the way, again, a person circumcised themselves and then they decided I don't want to go to the mikvah. 
Okay, so you're not Jewish. I can't help you. You know? So all part of that. The act of immersion, to feel it in contrast to that of circumcision, denotes the integration of a person in a great destiny and his entry into the covenant of si at Sinai. The Jews were charged with the commandment of immersion prior to the revelation of the laws at Sinai. Immersion signifies purification and ascension from the profane to the sacred. Look at what is that's, that's what I'm saying. If you, it depends on how you look at things. I can look, I have to go to the, I have to go to the mix because I'm spiritually impure and I'm coming to purity. No, it's not nice. It doesn't sound right. He's saying it so nicely. I'm ascending from the profane to the sacred, from, the or, from an ordinary prosaic life to a life replete with an exalted vision. I've joined the Jewish people. We have a vision to the end. It's beautiful. When the convert arises from his immersion, a spiritual reality is suffused with destiny is newly formed within him, and he becomes sanctified with the holiness of Israel. It is for not that the action that the act of, his, of acceptance of the yoke of the commandment is linked with the act of immersion. For immersion, at its core, has its sole purpose has as its sole purpose a representation of the experience of the revelation of the law and the ascension of a people through a freely assumed obligation perform the divine command to the rank of holy nation it is a if a gentile was circumcised but did not immerse himself he lacks that personal bond to jewish destiny such a gentile has disassociated himself from the covenant at sinai and from the ethical halachic identification with the holy nation in the conversation in the conversion formula to be found in the book of ruth both these aspects are set forth, and the gist is succinctly expressed by in his last two phrases: "Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my uh, my God." And we'll stop there on page sixty-three.